For those of you who follow Dr. William Lane Craig like I once did as a Christian, you might want to pay attention to this video. Dr. Craig should really uh, catch up to speed on ancient cosmology, back to the flat earth in a solid dome as a sky. Instead, he wants to keep modern science and apply it to an ancient book because, God forbid, this book is wrong and mistaken cosmologically. Is it possible he's wrong? Well, after this video, I think it's without a doubt. Ben Stanhope takes a serious dagger to this whole idea. And it's not just the Bible. It's every single cosmology around it as well. Stay tuned, guaranteed to learn something new. Hit the like button. Don't forget to let us know what you think down in the comment section. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Your host, Eric Lambert. Today, I have a guest, Ben Stanhope, joining us. We're going to delve into the cosmology in Genesis, but not just that you're going to learn something about the cosmology in Genesis, but there is an article that he has recently written on his website. I highly recommend everybody go check out where he is addressing the problems with William Lane Craig's cosmology and how he's still holding on. It's almost like the last thread of holding on to some idea for no reason at all, Ben says. <laughs> he really should just move on and realize that he's got this wrong. So, Ben, welcome to Myth Vision, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate uh, it. I know William Lane Craig has said before that he's not a concordist. And, you know, he's written that cool edgy book on Adam that everyone's talking about right now. Uh, <laughs> so I'm surprised he's taking the time to respond to me. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of strange to me that he uh, – holds on to this old sort of apologist belief that uh, cosmology in the Bible is somehow compatible with science. Um, it just seems unnecessary. I mean, most, a lot of Christian theologians I know of that are pretty well respected. I mean, they don't hold that. They take yeah. the mainstream view on this and they're perfectly fine with the idea that the Bible assumes that there's a flat earth and a solid sky dome and all that. If, and this, I love that you're saying this, you're just saying what it is. I love it. No beating around the bush. Um, just for the sake of our listeners, and this, I want everyone, if you're a skeptic and you don't agree with this worldview, I want you to understand that doesn't matter. At the end of the day, I'm really out to like get rid of fundamentalism is my whole thing, uh, like the crazies out there that I once was. Um, are you ontologically a Christian? I know it doesn't really matter, but I ask because that might help people to pay attention even more and say, this yeah. might be a brother in Christ who's trying to, you know, open the eyes of someone. So I, I was a Christian my entire life. I was educated at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I did a, a degree in apologetics. I did a distance degree or not a degree, but a certificate at Biola in apologetics. I've read William Lang's Craig's work my whole life, you know, ever since high school. He's what got me into apologetics and all that. I still love the guy. I think he's fantastic. But uh, yeah, right now I don't consider myself a Christian for a bunch of complicated reasons that I won't get into. If, if anything, I'm sort of Jewish, but I don't have Jewish ancestors, which is a weird position to be in. <laughs> got it. But yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. I love William Lane Craig. I'm not doing this because like I, I have any issue with him or like I'm an atheist or something. Right. Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that. I want everybody to go subscribe to his YouTube channel right now. Don't wait. If you want wings to go to heaven with, you got to subscribe right now. Hit the bell after you do. So that way YouTube remembers you and lets you know when something cool drops. Also, this is what we're going to be discussing today. You're going to want to go to bstanhope.com. That's down in the description as well. Check it out. Go subscribe to anything he's publishing here. He takes William Lane Craig to task on this particular uh, subject matter. So as you you know, you heard him say, he's a fan of William Lane Craig in many respects, and he has nothing, no bo bad bone in his body toward him. But there seems to be something that William Lane Craig just cannot let go of when it comes to cosmology in the Bible. And um, we're going to be doing with that today. So, Ben, I appreciate it. You have a presentation that you might can give us today, and I'm here. I don't have my popcorn ready, but I'll pretend that <laughs> it exists and enjoy listening. All right. 
You able to see it on the screen? Yes, sir. All right. So uh, essentially... Almost every Egyptologist or every Egyptologist that you're going to find, pretty much everyone who's a scholar of ancient Northwest Semitic religion uh, or Syriology, they believe that or they know essentially that uh, there's this consensus that ancient people believe that the earth was essentially flat and that there was this solid firmament over it. And William Lane Craig, um, for reasons I don't know if he has theological impediments or what, but he thinks that... Uh, Biblical cosmology is somehow compatible with ancient, with uh, modern science, and he does not believe that uh, this majority consensus view that almost everybody agrees on within these specified fields. Uh, he doesn't agree with them on this. So I want to start off just by reading a passage without introduction. Sometimes when the sky makes threatening noises. Women and children whimper and cry in fear. These are not empty cries. We all fear being crushed by the falling sky, the way our ancestors were in the beginning of time. I still remember an occasion that nearly happened to us. I was young then. We were camping in the forest near a small stream that flows into the Rio Mapalu. It was early in the night. There were no sounds of thunder or lightning in the sky. Everything was quiet. It was not raining and we could not feel a breath of wind. Yet suddenly we heard several loud cracks in the sky's chest. It came in rapid succession, each more violent than the last, and they seemed very close. It was really alarming. Everyone in our camp started to yell, yell and weep in fear. Aye, the sky is starting to collapse. We're all going to perish. Aye. I was also scared. I had not become a shaman yet, and I anxiously asked myself, What's going to happen to us? Is the sky really going to fall on us? Are we all going to be hurled into the underworld? At the time, there were still great shaman among us. For many of our elders were still alive. Several of them instantly started working together to hold up the sky. Their fathers and grandfathers had taught them this work long ago. This is how, once again, they were able to prevent its fall. Then, after a moment, everything got quiet. Yet I think that this time the sky nearly did shatter above us again. I know it has happened before, far, far away from our forest, where it is closer to the edges of the world. These distant places inhabitants were wiped out because they did not know how to hold it up. But where, but where we live, the sky is very high and much more solid. I think this is because we are at the center of the terrestrial layer. But one day, a long time from now, it may finally come crashing down on us. And this quote, of course, it's from a uh, Yanomani shaman from Brazil named Davy Copanawa within his autobiography. Wow. And uh, this is an outline of what I wanted to discuss. Uh, first, I want to talk about this concept that solid sky cosmology and a flat earth. It's essentially an anthropologic universal. Um, I've studied all, all over the world, uh, pretty much whenever you find an ancient culture, they almost universally believe, particularly the idea that, this, that the firmament is solid. I want to discuss flat earth cosmology in the Bible, uh, the solid sky and heavenly ocean in the Bible. I believe that the sky contains this idea that there's an ocean sustained uh, over this firmament. And then I want to talk about Egyptian parallels, Mesopotamian parallels, and then how ancient rabbinic sources interpreted the Bible and how they also contain these ideas. I love it already. <laughs> this is going to be fun. All right. So I've written a book critiquing the creation museum. It's entitled misinterpreting Genesis. And in one of the, in the appendix of that book, uh, I have a paper where I basically, I, when I looked into roughly 50 ancient cultures or traditional cultures, some extinct, some still living today. And I, I went to go see what do they believe about uh, cosmology, about like what is the heaven made of and the stars and the shape of the earth and all of that. And what I found is that pretty much because, uh, because the stars and the constellations move in unison, they look like they're embedded on a solid dome. 
And because the earth itself doesn't seem to move, it looks like the, the sky itself is moving. So people almost universally tend to believe, well, the sky must be solid. The stars must be embedded within the sky. And I wanted to fly through some examples of this just so people know that I'm not bluffing. Um, so I've read a lot of Native American biographies and uh, in the 1800s and, and 1900s, there were a bunch of ethnographers that went and recorded a bunch of Native American legends before they died out. And essentially most Native Americans believe that the sky is made of solid rock. Um, that's a very common belief because ancient people were frequently aware of meteorites that fell. Uh, that's why people in the Bible and uh, and the ancient Near East, they also believe that the sky might be made of iron because uh, iron is often found within meteors. So we have a bunch of myths of the Native Americans, for example, that talk about how, you know, someone went to the edge of the world and uh, they found where the sun sets and maybe they went beyond the sky dome. And there's a particular legend that I like that's found in a bunch of tribes where uh, men travel to the edge of the world and they end up getting crushed by the sky dome that falls on them. Uh, it's very similar in Australia. The main book on the subject is by a scholar named Diane Johnson called Night Skies of Aboriginal Australia. And she says, quote, despite my cautionary notes about different cosmologies, it is occasionally possible to identify universal themes. Most Australian Aboriginal people held a common view of the earth as flat, a disk surrounded by the boundless water of an ocean. Above, the th above this earth disk was a solid vault or canopy. Beyond this vault was the sky world, a vast and plentiful and beautiful place. So I believe this is basically kind of the same thing that the Bible has within it. And I'm not going to go into too much detail into these. There's, uh, there's just dozens and dozens of papers you can find on this of uh, people interviewing people, you know, from uh, tribes out in islands in the oceans. And almost always or always they believe this, that the sky is made out of uh, a solid stone. Um, I've read a bunch of papers of, about Africa and like what indigenous African people believe. Here's one paper uh, by Andrew Clegg. He states, quote, it is interesting to observe regardless of where man has sought to reflect upon and interpret the universe around him. He has come to roughly the same conclusions, which is the point that I'm making. He's observed this as well. The Sawana tribe's universe is geocentric. The earth is flat. At the edge of the earth is water. The sky is made of stone, the stone of God beyond which God lives. Beneath is water, or water is beneath the earth and it is above the sky. So I've already discussed South America. Um, we have Mayan texts, essentially, which describe these Bacab deities that uphold the sky. And there's this concept that if they were to let go of the sky and it would drop, it would destroy the earth, much like the uh, quotation that I read at the beginning of this presentation. And then in East Asia, in China and Japan, uh, China is the only civilization that I could find, ancient civilization that... Uh, proposed this idea of an atmospheric cosmology. They had uh, one school of thought which proposed it, and the other ones they believed in a solid dome, dome model as well. And then uh, there was also a model within ancient China around 2nd century AD that believed in this similar idea to Western cosmology, that the Earth has these hard crystalline spheres that the stars are attached to. But within Japanese and early Chinese cosmology, Again, the sky is made out of stone. Uh, and there's a paper I've cited here. It's entitled The Lapidary Sky Over Japan within the journal called Asian Folklore Studies, which details a bunch of these texts. And then two more examples real quick since I want to move on to the Near East and the Bible. So in early Greece, it's pretty well known among Hellenistic scholars that within the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Homeric period, essentially. We have all sorts of texts stating that the, that the heavens are a uh, iron bowl. And, right, you can follow through the uh, citations that I've put here and see uh, a bunch of different uh, Hellenistic scholars that have stated this. And within the Quran, actually, which I think is pretty interesting, and Syriac Christianity, which was the Quran's context historically, the Quran was somewhat responding to Syriac Christianity. A lot of people don't know that in Surah 18, Muhammad point blank says that uh, 
Alexander the Great traveled to the edge of the world and he saw the sun set within a pool of water. This is also stated in the Hadiths. But uh, we know where Muhammad got this story from, and it's from a Syriac text called the Alexander Legend, which we have, it, we still have copies of it. And in the Alexander Legend, yeah, it's a story about how Alexander the Great went to the edge of the world. He saw where the sun sets in a pool of water. And he took this heavenly conduit, this course that the sun travels through to get to the other side of the sky dome. So people don't don't realize that uh, Hellenistic cosmology didn't catch on all over the ancient world at the same time. There were still people within uh, the ancient Middle East, which were still believing in uh, these ancient, more biblical forms of cosmology all the way up until like the sixth and the seventh centuries. So conclusion. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love it. Look, I, I have a degree in apologetics, and I know that there's a lot of apologists. I know Lee Strobel used to do this in his books where they'll claim that um, ancient people were so knowledgeable about the heavens and, you know, they observed the stars and all of that. And uh, because they were so knowledgeable about the heavens, people will dismiss this idea that the Bible must contain unscientific cosmological ideas. And apologists are wrong about that. Almost everyone in the ancient world believed that the earth was flat, that the sky was a solid dome. And it would be really weird uh, if the Bible didn't assume these things, not weird that it does. So I think William Lane Craig has the burden of proof in that sense. So we can discuss... Um, the flat earth cosmology in the Bible. And I'm only going to cover a few texts here. People can read the article for uh, more details, but there is a, uh, an artifact called the uh, Babylonian map of the world. It's in the British museum. Uh, Irving Finkel, uh, the curator of the British museum has written a book about it, but uh, it, essentially a scribe in ancient uh, Mesopotamia took a compass. He inscribed a circle on this clay tablet representing the earth. And then he inscribed another circle outside of that, which represents this uh, ocean, which is called the bitter river, which encompasses the flat disc of the earth with an ancient Mesopotamian thought. And the Swiss Egyptologist, most noticed, most notably uh, Othmar Kiel, he's written several books where he, talks about how, hey, this exact same idea is in the Bible. Um, so, for example, Proverbs 8, verse 27, quote, I was there when God drew a circle, a chug in Hebrew, on the face of the deep. And the word for drawing there is basically a derivative of the Hebrew word for compass. It's the same concept at play. And we have a similar statement in Job 26, 10. God has inscribed a circle on the face of the waters as the boundary of between light and darkness. So in other words, you know, you have the disc of the earth and the horizon is itself where the sun rises over the flat disc of the earth. And that's the boundary of light and darkness. And Othmar Kale has also pointed out that uh, the circular river ocean concept that we see within Mesopotamian cosmology is it's also point blank in the Bible. Uh, Psalm 24, 2 says, God has founded the earth upon the seas, upon the rivers established it. So in Ugaritic texts, in Akkadian texts, in the Bible, you have this giant ocean that encompasses the disk of the earth. And it's referred to as both an ocean and a river linguistically, because it's, you know, it's, it looks like a river, the sort of ring of river, as you see depicted on the uh, map of the world tablet. And then we have a uh, Psalm 72, eight, which reads, let God dominate from sea upon sea and from the river upon the ends of the earth. So you have this parallel concept, the sea upon the sea, and then it restates that idea as the river upon the ends of the earth. We also see this exact same idea represented within Egyptian art. And uh, this is a quotation from Othmar Kale's book. He points out how there is a, uh, Sarcophagus from the necropolis of Saqqara, called the Sarcophagus of uh, Werish Nefer. And it basically depicts and labels this circular disk of the earth and then the encompassing uh, river ocean around it. And then uh, for a final text for the flat disk of the earth uh, within contextually within Mesopotamian thought, 
We have the Neo-Assyrian Atana legend. For people that don't know, the Atana legend is about this ancient king named Atana who gets carried up into the sky by an eagle and he sees the earth, uh, you know, from so many miles up in the sky and he's describing how it looks within the text. And he describes it uh, in one place as a boundary ditch, as a boundary ditch, which in ancient Mesopotamian like agriculture, it's this uh, circular ditch that you would dig around a garden. Uh, he describes it as an animal pen, which again is most likely a circular, uh, like the sea is depicted as a sort of circular animal pen. And then, yeah, the land is like a garden. The sea is its irrigation ditch, which we have stated again. So in ancient Mesopotamian thought and ancient Egyptian thought and ancient biblical thought, I can argue, I believe from ancient Ugaritic texts that they also believe that the same concept of a flat disk of the earth surrounded by a rig of ocean. And, uh, Right, so we can move on to the solid sky and heavenly ocean of the Bible, which is what most people are interested in. So one thing that I just want to point out is like uh, anyone who's familiar with the Bible, like if you just read it on your bedside, um, if you mm. read ancient Near Eastern texts, like every time that the sky is referred to, it's virtually always like uh, done so with solid metaphors or sol language of solidity. And I'm not going to read all these examples here, but obviously, you know, you have phrases in the Bible like the foundations of the heavens and the the heavens shaking. And we're told in the Psalms that God made the heavens like they're his handiwork. And he separated the heavens from the earth, which tends to assume that the heavens and the earth are somewhat the same substance. Uh, we find that all, all over the place with the ancient Near Eastern texts. You know, you have the vision of... Uh, Jacob's ladder where Jacob sees angels ascending and descending on a ladder to heaven uh, that reaches to the top of the sky. Um, and obviously uh, we also have like in second Kings 23, 11, um, there's a text that says that uh, educated Royal Judahites believed in some form of solar chariot theology in the temple and King Josiah did not like this. <laughs> so he abolished it. And, uh, burn the chariot and the horses representing it. So, you know, ancient Judahites weren't above this sort of mythology of the sun traveling across the sky in a chariot, you know, just so people know for context. And obviously within Mesopotamian texts, this stuff is all over the place as well. Uh, in the Gilgamesh epic at the end, of, or in the middle of the story, when Gilgamesh gets to the edge of the earth, the texts say that the mountains that he's passing through are touching the sky. Um, you had this legend of Mesopotamia and Atrahasis that the great Anzu bird rips open the sky and that causes the flood that destroys the world. So all this to say, I think it's actually kind of obvious that the sky is solid in the Bible. Um, a lot of this stuff is just metaphor and William Lane Craig likes to point that out that, Oh, this is just metaphor and it's artistic speech, but it's like a, uh, it clearly favors one side of the argument, man. Like they never use metaphors that are particularly uh, atmospheric, for example. Um, mm. And I have to decide how much of this I want to get into specifically, <laughs> but uh, William Lane Craig really like he, he takes me to task and really doesn't like this idea that the ancients believe that the sky is particularly a solid like dome, like a bowl which I think isn't weird at all to believe because almost every anthropological source I can find, you know, outside the Bible, like some of the ones that I just quoted at the beginning of this pre presentation, it's very natural for people to believe that the heavens are a bowl uh, because it kind of just looks like that from the earth. But yes, uh, we have Egyptian texts and art, which depict the heavens as a bowl. Um, they have several shapes for the heaven for the heavens. We have Aegean poetry that refers to the heavens as a bull. Uh, we have the great hymn to Shamesh, uh, which describes the heavens as a vessel like a seer's bull. Um, we have the Akkadian text, Car 25, which uh, says that heaven is something like the incense bull of the gods. Um, even the Hebrew word for uh, for heaven that's at play here, it's rakia in Hebrew. It has cognates and other Semitic languages that refer to bowls or to metal platters. 
And here's some Egyptian depictions of the sort of thing that I'm talking about. Are you saying if it walks like a duck and talks? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is uh, probably one of my favorite texts uh, with regard to this discussion. Uh, it's very rare to see people address it very fully. But Job 37, 18, uh, the text says, I'm looking at in the Hebrew here. Can you spread out with him um, the skies hard, the idea is strong as a mirror of cast metal? Um, so it's very hard to explain what this text means if it's not just referring to God fashioning the skies. This was seen as an amazing thing in the ancient world um, within texts all over in different cultures, how God fashion, how the gods or God fashion the heavens. Um, when the Bible was translated into Greek, the Old Testament and the Septuagint, uh, the Greek translators chose the Greek word steroma, which in every single case in ancient texts where we have it, it's very explicit that it means something solid. So yeah, so yeah. Uh, I mentioned that in the Bible, uh, there's this concept of the waters above and it's in Genesis one um, where God said, where God, uh, he creates the heavens called the Rakia in Hebrew. And then he separates the waters below from the waters above. And we also find these waters above this ocean above the sky in ancient rabbinic texts. We find it uh, in ancient, especially in ancient Egyptian texts. It's very explicit. And this is a quotation from Othmar Kale. Um, for people don't, that don't know, part of the reason why I'm quoting Othmar Kale so much is that William Lane Craig misrepresented him as someone supporting his side in one of his articles. Um, <laughs> Othmar Kale happens to be uh, someone that I've read quite a bit of because he's one of the main scholars uh, that's involved in the subject that my master's thesis was involved with. Um, so I think William Lane Craig has misrepresented his actual views to the public. Uh, for example, uh, this quotation here, uh, Othmar Kale is discussing on the sarcophagus of Weresh Nefer. There is a text that labels uh, the upper, the waters above the heavens as the cool or upper waters of Horus. Uh, if we move on, these are three articles and one is a book that, or two articles and one is a book that you can go look up uh, if people doubt me on this. Um, yeah, every Egyptologist that you find are going to believe that there was this solid firmament, that there's uh, waters above the heavens or an ocean above the heavens. Um, and these texts, you know, they discuss the Egyptian hieroglyphs in the original language. And comparison with Mesopotamia. So I think we're, we're getting uh, pretty far into the presentation here, but... Um, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. We can talk afterwards if that if that helps. William Lane Craig. Well, I'll just. Yeah, William Lane Craig is very much opposed to this idea that particularly the ancient Babylonians believed that the sky was a solid firmament, which every single Assyriologist that I've ever read on the subject that has discussed it, uh, including one scholar named Francisca Rockberg, which I think he misuses her work <laughs> people can, can go meet go read my article about that but uh every scholar that i'm aware of within a seriology that's discussed the subject believes that you know the ancient mesopotamians believe that the sky was solid um and here's a text it's car 307 we have it quoted also on another text called ao 8196 quote the upper heavens are lulu danlu stone uh they belong to the god Anu. He settled the 300 Agigi gods inside. The middle heavens are Sigilman stone. They belong to the Agigi. Bel, or Marduk, is who this is here, sat on the high platform inside. And then the lower heavens. So these are the heavens that you see from the earth. Uh, these are Jasper. They belong to the stars. He drew the constellations of the gods on them. So what you have here within uh, ancient Mesopotamian cosmology is the heavens stacked on top of each other like a layer cake. Um, we get the same concept within Middle Persian cosmology as well. 
And they also point blank state that the substance of the heavens are made out of crystal or stone. But yeah, here we have a text. It's written plain as day that when you look up at the sky, you know, the lower heavens, they're, they are Jasper, whatever that means. Um, there was you know, a person. If, if I may, Ben, just to throw this out there and get your thoughts just briefly, and I won't take much time because I really want to see this presentation. This is amazing. I wonder if like some type of ca um, catastrophic events took place. And if you go and see the site of the aftermath, if there's a crystallization on the ground, you know, solidified rock or whatever, that might have influenced their cosmology in some way, looking down and seeing the natural phenomena of crystallization of certain phenomena. And they go, whoa, right. that came from the heavens. Therefore, you know, I don't know. That's, but a, I kinda that's a very good point. Uh, and it's very well established, actually. Um, actually, uh, I think. Yeah, Victoria Almanza Villatoro's article discusses this with res with reference to ancient Egypt. Um, mm. The metal of the sky and the sky of metal within Egyptian thought. The ancient Egyptians, like, before the Iron Age, before they, you know, had the ability to, to manufacture iron, Egyptians were reaping iron from well-known meteorite fall sites within their lands. And we actually have, like, uh, King Tut's tomb, for example, he had, like, a dagger uh, and some trinkets made out of meteorite iron. Hmm. Uh, so this is, it's just so obvious. This is why ancient people believe that the sky is made out of stone while it, why it's made out of, uh, metal. Um, and in this text car 307, when it says the lower heavens are Jasper, the reason why it's probably Jasper, most people think of Jasper as like a red stone, uh, within we have ancient sources that just point blank state that there was a type of Jasper uh, within the ancient world from Persia that was sky blue. It, it was just the color of the sky. So I know William Lane, William Lane Craig's objection to this text is that he thinks it's just mythology and that we don't know enough about it that we can use it to contextualize ancient hmm. Babylonian and ancient Assyrian thought about the heavens then we can't with the Bible either, I guess. <laughs> My reason why I think that we can take this as literal and why the vast majority of the seriologists that I've read take it literal, for example, Wayne Horowitz and his book, uh, Mesopotamian Cosmic Geography. Uh, he's the primary scholar that's written the top book on the subject. But when we go to all these other ancient Near Eastern examples, we see that they're being literal. Um, we know in Middle Persian thought, they believed in ideas that were downstream of Mesopotamian cosmology. They also had a three tier heaven with gods residing in each heaven like this. And they seem to believe that uh, the heavens are literally solid as well, which tends to backward contextualize these texts. And then there's the instance of rabbinic texts, which are pretty explicit, which I'm going to uh, be getting into here in a minute. And oh yeah, uh, so the waters above in ancient Assyrian thought, in ancient Babylonian thought, for example, uh, most scholars interpret these uh, as pretty apparent within the Enuma Elish, which is sort of the creation myth of ancient Babylon. Essentially, the myth goes that uh, the god Marduk, he fights this cosmic dragon, which is an idea that, which is all over the place in the Bible. Uh, the biblical authors love this myth. But once he slays the, once Marduk slays this dragon, he built the world out of her body. So he severs her, severs her in half. The upper half becomes the sky. The bottom half becomes the earth, which tends to assume again that the sky is solid because it's made of the same substance as the earth. And then the text says that uh, he roofs over like a tent. Essentially, he stretches out the top part of this dragon to make the sky. And he does this in order that her waters, which are presumed to be above, can't escape. They can't flood the earth down below, which is an idea that we kind of see in Genesis uh, chapter one, verses seven through eight, where God makes the firmament and he separates the water, which are below. He separates the water, which is below the firmament and the waters, which are above the firmament. All right. So the early rabbinic sources, and this is, this will be the last of it. And then maybe we can discuss some of this, but yeah, I've just selected some at random uh, ancient, we have Jew Jewish texts from, say, like uh, 300 BC to uh, maybe like 500 AD. 
which, yeah, they discuss the cosmology and how the heavens work and so forth in great detail. And look, my argument is that ancient Jews within the Hellenistic period, they wouldn't have gotten dumber than Jews, you know, writing all the way back when Isaiah was alive, like in 600 BC and 700 BC. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll show you some text real quick. So this is uh, after Christ, uh, a text called Third Baruch, chapter three, verses six through eight. And appearing to them, the Lord changed their languages. By that time, they had built the tower. So this is Babel, uh, 463 cubits high and taking an auger. These men attempted to pierce the heavens, saying, let us see whether the heaven is made out of clay or copper or iron. Seeing these things, God did not permit them to continue, but he struck them with blindness and with confusion of tongues. And this story is also contained within the Talmud, by the way. In the Talmud, actually, it specifically says that they try to uh, take an axe and break open the heavens, the men of Babel, in order that its waters might gush forth, is what the text says. Uh, this is a text called Bereshit Rabbah, uh, Chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, I'll be quoting from this one a lot, actually. But yeah, here's a discussion with the rabbis. How do the sun and moon set? Rabbi Judah, son of uh, Rabbi Lai, and the rabbis disagree. Rabbi Judah says, behind the dome and above it. So <laughs> once it gets night, the sun goes down and it goes behind the dome. So it's walled off by the dome, and that's why it's dark. And then the other rabbis say behind the dome and below it. So these other guys are saying, well, maybe it goes into the underworld. Rabbi Simon, son of Yochai said, we do not know if uh, the celestial bodies fly up in the air, if they scrape the firmament or if they travel as usual. I'm not sure what he means by as usual necessarily, but the matter is impossible for humans to determine. This is another text from Bereshit Rabbah. The thickness of the firmament, the rakia, equals that of the earth. Compare. It is God that sits above the circle, the hug of the earth, in Isaiah, verse, or in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, with, and he walked in the circuit of the heaven. The use of hug in both verses teaches that they are alike. Rabbi Aha said in Rabbi Jenna's name, it is as thick as a metal, as a metal plate. So here the rabbis are looking at this word for the firmament in the Bible. It's called a rakia in Hebrew. And it's related to ideas of pounded out metal. Um, it contains, it conveys this idea of solidity and they're speculating, well, maybe it's as thick as a metal plate and they're making speculation about the thickness of this solid dome above the earth. This is the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, the, sig the sages of Israel maintain the sun travels beneath the sky by day and above the sky by night. So again, we have this idea that it's hid hidden above the wall of the firmament at night, and that's why you can't see the sun at night. While the sages of the nations of the world maintain it travels beneath the sky by day and below the earth at night, uh, said one rabbi, and their view is preferable to ours, for the wells are cold by day but warm at night. So the reason why I bring up this text is that you have the rabbis distinguishing their view that the sun travels um, behind the sky at night from the Hellenistic view that it travels in the underworld that they later encountered. And you can see that, uh, yeah, they're pulling back on their ancient Near Eastern tradition and they're thinking intelligent, intelligently about these new ideas that they're encountering and they, they're drawing a line of distinction between them. And let's see how many I have. Yeah, two more that I just that I've pulled up. Yeah, but when the Holy One, blessed be he, ordered, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, the middle layer of water solidified, and the heavens were formed. So here you have another statement that, yeah, ancient Jews believed that the sky was, was solid. And then we have uh, these other texts from Bereshit Rabbah. Uh, the Holy One, blessed be he, roofed over his world with nothing but water. And then you have this other statement. Again, yeah, on the second day, the rakia, so the heavens, they congealed. They're formed out of solidified water. 
And if people want more text like this, I can give you roughly 20 pages of, you know, very explicit statements by ancient rabbis. Uh, it's contained within this journal article that you can find online for free. It's easily, easily accessed on academia.edu. It's entitled The Heavens Proclaim the Glory of God by Moshe Simon Shoshan. So, yeah, here's a plug for my book. Uh, Joel Osteen drives an Airbus, or he rides an Airbus A300. I drive a Toyota Corolla, so make that fair. Buy my book. <laughs> uh, here's another ad. I'm fully embracing capitalism here. Go for but, it. Yeah, the title of the book is Misinterpreting Genesis, and it's a critique of the Creation Museum. Basically, uh, the sort of thing that you're interested in, uh, just addressing fundamentalists and people's crazy views about the Bible. And that is wow. the end of the presentation that I have. Rock on, Ben. <laughs> that was really good. Literally, rock on. Um, this this was a really fascinating uh, presentation. I don't know uh, what would you think, and maybe you're getting in those motives. What do you think? Why do you think he pushes back on this? If you were to honestly try, when to I know, when I used to follow William Lane Craig like back in college uh, years ago, he used to hang out with Hugh Ross and. He would say a lot of things that like a lot of us were doing at the time that were really um, juvenile about Genesis. And we were all kind of under under this idea of concordism and the idea that the Bible has. God doesn't lie, so the Bible can never contradict science. And if it does, then the whole thing is useless and, and all mm. that whole argument. And William Lane Craig over the years, like especially with John Walton, uh, coming into discussion within the evangelical world. Like uh, I've seen him advance like greatly in his knowledge of, of Genesis one. And, you know, kind of all of us have been forced to because of all the excellent scholarship that's come out. And I think this is just like one sort of the last vestige of something that he's holding on to that, like maybe he's defended it for so long that he's convinced about it. But I mean, He's he's way way like on the fringe outside of the consensus. Um, yeah, you're not you're probably not going to find an Egyptologist that would deny that there were waters above the heavens within ancient Egyptian cosmology, for example. Um, it's just yeah, <laughs> that's that's all I can do to speculate intelligently about his motives. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think there's probably, like you said, some theological issue uh, that might prevent it, and I could be wrong. I do enjoy what you presented. It makes me think how much more you didn't show that there might be out there within everything from Islam, you name it. I was thinking about in Proto-Indo-European mythology that uh, yeah. I think there's a serpent uh, that is the, the shoreline, if you will, holding the waters in and stuff. And then... Uh, you know, I don't know why this came to mind. I wanted to throw it at you to get your thoughts. When God writes the Ten Commandments, he writes them in stone. I wonder if there is some hint at, and I don't know the Hebrew, or if there's some idea that this is stone from the heavens, that he's giving him a rock from on high. And the reason, he, he you know, God might be writing this on heavens, there might be parallel to this idea in the, the Arabic uh, uh, Islamic tradition where Here's God giving, you know, the Quran, right, directly yeah. from heaven, if you will. I, I don't know. I just thought maybe he's I don't writing. Know off the top of my head either. I guess you could always wash away that argument with, with like the, the metaphor that obviously it's in stone and that just symbolizes that it's eternal. But yeah, just I'd have thought. to review the text and think about it. Yeah, I, I don't know why it came to my mind because the whole heaven and earth thing. The uh, uh, you you mentioned Indo-European mythology, like man, the uh, I don't know enough about it to speak too intelligently, but like uh, you know the whole Norse idea of this dragon that encompasses the earth and he represents the cosmic waters that surround it. That's that's so similar to so many ancient Near Eastern civilizations. Like in Egypt, you have a pep, which which is the name of the the cert, the uh, cosmic serpent that the sun god has to battle in the underworld and mm -hmm. you know you have leviathan and, and lotan within the ugaric mythology and it's just like it's crazy to think about like the commonality and like psychological structure in the human brain that produce this same idea in such disassociated cultures as like <laughs> 
yeah, you know, Viking mythology and, and like uh, the Bible. Yeah. I, you know, there's an author, John Knight Lunwall, who write, wrote on the oralities of people. He has an interesting uh, position where before we were writing and we were oral people, uh, things weren't compartmentalized the same way. So whether or not some of the stuff came from the same uh, actual oral transmission somehow, or if this was just the common perception from all men's, you know, we all look up, we all see the moon. Uh, if, if we're in somewhat of the similar region, but we're all seeing the same things in the night sky. And so maybe they're drawing perception wise. We're all drawing from similar sources without necessarily having this stuff being passed along orally. But what you did yeah. in this presentation that I found fascinating is just so that you could say, by the way, this is not just the Bible. Like, in fact, it's everywhere. Uh, that builds your case up really, really well. I would say William Lane Craig's best argument that I've seen that I can't answer just because not enough data is uh, he points out like, uh, well, the heavens, they can't be like a solid dome because um, all ancient people know that the stars and the constellations are rotating. And if they're a solid dome, how are they rotating? Like if there's, if, if the solid dome is resting on pillars, like on, uh, uh, on the edge of the earth, like how can, how can that be rotating or whatever? But what I can say is that we do have parallels. Like I told, like I mentioned ancient, uh, or in native American mythology, you know, there's a story of like, well, yeah, it does rotate. And like it, uh, there's these legends about how people go to the edge of the earth and they get crushed by it falling on them because it's moving and that sort of thing. But how people in the ancient near East, uh, would have explained that, or if they would have even cared to explain it, I have, I'm not sure. It's interesting to think about. I know from what I understand, snow and all these other natural phenomena that we have, um, they're, they're in storehouses and things like that. Uh, they're kind of like in little barns, if I could use the term, uh, you know, they're bring the snow out and then they will bring the snow. Out. I wonder if the stars to some, to some extent, uh, maybe there aren't fixed ones, but some of them are stored away and the angels the Elohim, the divine ones, if you will, to be more accurate with that later on, Septuagint, you know, Christianity, oh, they're angels and not gods, uh, are bringing the stars out at night and then putting them away in the storehouses. So I, I don't know. I've heard this before from some people who've come on the channel that, you know, snow, uh, other natural phenomena, the, the stars, they come out and then they're put back up in the they go back and be put in a way when daylight comes. So I, I don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, I wish I could remember the source off the top of my head. I think it's in Bereshit Rabbah probably, but uh, I know of like a, one ancient rabbinic text, maybe from like third century AD sometime around then where it contains this idea that the clouds, they they'll go up to heaven and then like uh, they'll draw water from the heavens itself or, you know, presumably baby snow or whatever. And then, and then they'll drop them on the earth. So like, you know, ancient people, they obviously knew that it's like not falling directly from the sky itself. That it's falling from clouds, but, uh, right. No precipitation. Yeah, they didn't, mind. they didn't know about, they didn't know as much about the water cycle as, you know, a lot of apologists probably tend to, uh, try to convince people. Um, I wow. tend to think like I'm, I'm perfectly fine with the idea of the storehouses of hail and so forth might be just metaphor. Um, I don't really need them to be literal necessarily. Yeah, I, I, I totally get it. I mean, it's I love the flat earth thing, too, that you brought up because this gets dodged. I received an email from some flat earth guy. And he's oh, like, man, flat earth people love my videos and my work because <laughs> they're I like, bet. yeah, it's in the Bible. If you believe the Bible, you got to believe that the earth is flat. It's like, that's not <laughs> what I'm getting at here at all. I definitely think that's funny. Uh, really, really, that is funny because I've had a guy who said uh, he's going to come on and he wants me to invite him on so he could prove the I that uh, the earth is flat and that, you know, you'll be blown away. Now, I don't think he believe he knows that I don't personally believe in the Bible, but I, I thought it was really funny how he was like, it's definitive. I have over 200 verses to prove the earth is flat from the Bible. And I'm like, 
okay like so what you know but he wanted to try and try and convince me that this is proof that it's true because he actually he actually believes that the earth is flat that's the difference and i think a lot of people don't you know really take that into consideration like i wonder if the modern flat earth movement came out from taking these literal approaches uh to the bible yeah. Yeah. um I don't want to say it because I'm probably wrong, but I think I've seen at least like one survey or study that indicated that uh, many, if not most, flat earthers tend to be evangelicals. Um, there's there's this obvious connection between it, which when I was a young earth creationist, which I was growing up in for many years, I myself was pretty prone to conspiratorial thinking and conspiracies. And the reason for that is that I believe that there was this international conspiracy among scientists like across archaeology and paleontology and geology and, so, and, and just like every field all across the globe. And they were all suppressing the evidence for a young earth. Yeah. And if you believe that that's going on, it's like, man, you can believe anything. And it's like, uh, yeah, I can kind of see how those people would believe in a flat earth because it's pretty easy to prove from the Bible. <laughs> And if you believe in this sort of a uh, concordist idea that the Bible, like God doesn't lie. So the Bible must be true in every way. Then uh, yeah, they're being fully uh, coherent within their own worldview to believe in a flat earth, I guess. Yeah, man, that, uh, well, I'm glad you came on. I really hope more people consider getting the book. Uh, the book is not only advertised here, uh, <laughs> but also advertised. He Where did I put it? Here it is. Uh, let me, let me remove this and pop this up here. Make sure you go get the book. Here it is on Amazon. The link is down in the description of the video. Misinterpreting Genesis, how the Creation Museum misunderstands the ancient Near Eastern context of the Bible. And, of course, uh, go support him there. This uh, is in the same vein of, of research that we talk on with, with scholars like Dr. Joshua Bowen. He did a video on the Earth being flat, the cosmology, et cetera, et cetera. Highly recommend you guys get it. Check it out down in the description. Help this gentleman get a mansion and move to Hollywood. Okay? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Kim right? Ham has never responded or acknowledged to that book that I spent several years writing about him. Yeah. There's other people who did uh, recently a good friend, Gutsick Gibbon. I don't know if you saw her two hour video. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she's awesome. She is yeah. wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, big evolution. Uh, she's actually going to get her PhD in this particular field. So, she knows something. Uh, that's that's what matters. I really, really enjoyed this, Ben. Um, is there anything I didn't mention that we need to plug for you? No, everything's – that's all of it. So the website, the book, and uh, the YouTube channel. So go to all three. Help them out there. Last question I have. I noticed that Amazon wanted to suggest a few books when I popped this up, right? And And notice the books that they suggested. Right here, John Walton, and then I believe, yep, John Walton. So oh, um, this is in the vein of John Walton, or is recommending it. My question is, does John Walton see this? Does John Walton acknowledge and accept this ancient cosmology and what they believed, the authors of these texts, isn't accurate in terms of modern science? Obviously he does, since he's a Semitist. Like, the vast, vast majority of Semitists are aware of this. It's uh, it's pretty much in your face all over the place in the Bible. So, yeah, that's one source people can go to if they want to learn more about it is um, most of John Walton's books about uh, the Hebrew Bible. Interesting. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. I hope I did a good job of hosting you here. Try I tried to remain silent because I have a motor mouth. I wanted you to get through... Uh, this wonderful presentation. You put some really good energy into that too. So I hope you keep this because I have some friends I'm sure would love to have you on to present this uh, to a wider audience. And let's make you, let's make you move to Hollywood with those books. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thanks man. I appreciate it. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're wanting to know if the sky is solid or hard or soft or what, maybe you say these three words and this chant might reveal the truth to you. We are Myth Vision.